Housing developments are being stopped all over the Southwest right now due to a lack of water. From cities like Phoenix, Las Vegas, small towns hugging small bodies of water like Lake Powell, where the water levels have gotten so low that previously submerged places from the dams have made their way back onto the map. A lot is changing in the Southwest. For decades, cities like Phoenix have been the fastest growing cities in America. But with water levels dropping to historic lows to the point that even the Hoover Dam may have to shut down, you could say that the odds against future growth are looking a bit stacked. And with over 40 million people now dependent on the dwindling Colorado River, a great exodus could quickly affect the entire country and even globalize markets. So what's gonna happen in the coming year? And future decades if this problem continues to persist? But with such a large problem spanning a land area larger than Western Europe, where does a story of this scope even begin? Well, it begins somewhere around here, over the Pacific Ocean. Blown in by Western trade winds, large storms somewhat regularly pour into the Southwest. But over time, that amount has decreased, while at the same time, temperatures have increased, making the soil drier. The soil getting drier is a big deal, especially when it comes to keeping the Colorado River full. This is because dry soil absorbs more water, meaning less water will rest on top of the soil. And while that's great for reducing flooding, there is, however, another effect when you turn down the temperature, turning the rain droplets into snow. Meaning that there's less snowpack leaking down into the Colorado River every year. And so we are getting to the point that if the water line drops another 150 feet, then all of this shuts down. Cutting off the spigot to over 40 million people and over 5 million acres of farmland. Along with 1.4 million people losing power. But all the water flow could potentially stop if the United States federal government is forced to step in to this currently regional problem. Because what they could do is rule X amount of water must be retained before they open the gates. But with a problem so foreboding, why haven't the local states handled it already? Well, that's because this water shortage issue is actually an incredibly complicated problem. I mean, where could we possibly cut back? In what part of our lives could we become more sustainable? If only the solution was obvious. But because the solution was not obvious, I went and asked some Arizona senators to get an idea of where to look for such a solution. I think we need to deal with the appropriate allocation of agricultural water. Uh, over, uh, something like 70% of the water uh, that comes from the Central Arizona Project is going to agriculture. Now, I, I, I like agriculture. I like the income I want. And uh, that's as far as the tape got before my camera overheated and two people fainted next to me. It was a very hot day. But essentially, he said agriculture is great, but we need to cut back somehow because it's so water intensive. Now, what could we do with that information? So now armed with this basic direction to head towards, I scoured the Southwest looking for answers. I looked at data, people, buildings, weird attractions, landscapes, and curse the real culprits along the way. Trying to find that silver bullet so that we can save tens of millions of homes, livelihoods, and futures. And after looking really, really hard, I think I found it. The problem that must be solved. Him. Cows and the food they eat are the biggest users of water in the Southwest by a lot. One of their main foods, alfalfa, is almost exclusively for cow feed, and much of it is grown locally here in the Southwest. Which begs the question, why are they growing water-intensive crops like alfalfa in the desert anyway? That's because of the weather. Due to the climate, an alfalfa farmer can do 9 to 10 harvests a year instead of the regular 2 to 3, making it a big moneymaker for farmers and expands the cow capacity of ranchers ballooning the size of the cattle industry to over 12 billion annually in just the Southwest. And that's over a decade ago in 2012. I couldn't find anything past that, specifically on the Southwest. 
But on a national level, cattle ranching is absolutely enormous, worth over $462 billion a year in 2022. And where there's a lot of money being made, there's a lot of water being spent. 32% of the Southwest's total water usage goes to cattle farming. To put that in perspective, residential housing is six. Yeah, seems the yards and pools aren't the main culprit. In fact, if you switch out a farm for a regular suburban subdivision, you'll actually save water. Even better if it's an apartment complex. But if there's some measure of a pro to all this, at least the cattle industry pretty much just feeds America when you balance the imports and exports of beef. But I found another thing. And here is where shit gets really crazy. Since 2015, the Arizona State Land Department is letting a Saudi Arabian dairy company rent 6,000 acres of Arizona farmland. Farmland that's on top of an aquifer. An aquifer with no regulations so they can pull up as much water as they can get. So they can grow alfalfa and then ship it to Saudi Arabia because Saudi Arabia ran out of water to do it themselves. For those of you living in the Southwest, here's a picture of a basket of puppies. Studies have shown that puppies reduce the risk of high blood pressure and related aneurysms. <laughs> Remember to breathe. Okay, moving on. So instead of stopping the development of housing, perhaps we should be stopping the development of alfalfa farms? And on the cattle front, some places are already addressing this issue in a limited capacity. Like in LA, where they essentially pay alfalfa farmers not to farm for a certain cycle. It's called farrow. Not that kind of farrow. That kind of farrow. Or in Casa Grande AZ, where it seems new farms or water intensive crops are far more difficult to open or to continue to operate, putting a cap on the issue. And all of this is a great start. It helps create models and plans for what we could do in the future. However, these are smaller and regional solutions and only save a drop in the bucket when compared to the scale of the entire issue. The only real way to fix it is to make a comprehensive plan between all the states involved. And there's one very good reason as to why that hasn't happened yet. This is still the Wild West. That would have been a lot cooler if I actually had a cowboy hat. Maybe it wouldn't have been. There's an old saying in Arizona, whiskey's for drinking, water's for fighting over. Could you use a little water in your whiskey? And in order to understand water rights in the Southwest, you must first understand the term prior appropriation, which essentially means the person who first starts using the water has first priority to that water. The most valuable resource of the Arizona Desert Empire is water. This mentality was struck between the states back in the 1920s and was a way to resolve seemingly unending local level disputes. So what this created was a water system built on seniority, and those who were prioritized were the ones who started using the water first. Think of it as a series of dams. You could soak up as much water as you wanted, enabling you to dry up everyone else downstream, up until the point you've turned off the spigot to them completely. But such a dramatic ability was only theoretical given how small the water usage was and how much water was flowing at the time. But now we fast forward into modern times and this system was not prepared for the massive growth, urbanization, industrialized farming, or climate changes. Nonetheless, in 2007, the powers that be came together and built an emergency drought plan on top of this old water allocation structure for the lower basin. And after thumbing through these enormous documents for far too long, here is how the emergency plan would likely unfurl in practice. In Appendix G on page 9 of the shortage allocation model is a chart with an emulated water shortage scenario and how it would play out. Now before we commence with this little water war game, here are a few things you need to know. There are three stages to the drought plan that affect how much each state must reduce its water. In each stage, different states are affected differently. The main entities in this plan are California, Nevada, Mexico, and Arizona. Who gets totally f Stage one, a mildly bad drought scenario. Still pretty bad. There's a water shortage of 500,000 acre feet. 
An acre foot is basically an eight lane swimming pool or 325,850 gallons. At this level of drought, it is up to only a few entities to make up for that water shortage. Nevada will make up 3.33% or 16,667 acre foot, Mexico 16.67 or 83,333, California with resounding 0%, so that's zero acre foot of water because math, and then there's Arizona with 80% or 400,000 of the 500,000 swimming pool deficit. So even with a mild shortage, people in AZ will notice. But how much is 400,000 swimming pools anyway? Like, really, the human brain is not designed to quantify this amount of stuff. So to better understand what this would actually look like in reality, allow me to illustrate it for you. Just kidding. I'll try another visual via totem pole. Who gets affected the most by the coming shortage locally is kind of like how it works on a national level. It just gets broken down even more and affects different people in industries more or less severely. In Arizona, there's five levels of water priorities. So the higher your number on your priority list, the lower on the totem pole you are. So you'll want to be as close to priority one as possible at the very top. In Arizona, the top of that totem pole is the Native American communities like Ak Chin. The bottom being the Arizona Water Bank with a resounding water allocation of zero. They must have a fantastic savings account. So with a 400,000 gallon reduction in Arizona, you'll see that the bottom three tiers get smacked. The bottom tier doesn't really notice much since zero is allocated to it anyway, but then the fourth priority is lower tier agriculture. So the fight of who's truly lower will be a thing, as we've already discussed. And then in tier three is the municipalities, which is where things start to get really spicy from a real estate perspective, because that's when the cities themselves must start reducing their water. So when third priority gets hit, all these cities and communities all must essentially reduce their water usage by up to 25% across the board, which pretty much means if you lived in one of these places, you must reduce your water usage by, oh, 35, 40% would be my guess. I'll explain this totally opinion-based jump from 25 to maybe all as high as 40% later, but spoiler alert, my theory is based on the doctrine of the world ain't fair. Speaking of fairness, that was a relatively mild drought in example one. Here's a second scenario, but instead of a 500,000 swimming pool deficit, it's 1.8 million. Triggering stage two. You can pause here to see the official chart of this example, but here's a summarized version on the map. Essentially, when the going gets really rough, California starts to pick up the tab. Arizona still contributes significantly, while Mexico and Nevada hold steady. But I will say, when things get really tough, I do wonder if we will actually be so nice to Mexico given their favorable allocation, because at this point, things are likely getting a bit. So far, much of the focus on traditional networks I see is pointed at housing, especially for the middle to low income housing, who are dependent on the river, unlike many luxury homes on their own personal wells. Now, what ends up happening to the housing market will probably really resemble what happened in Las Vegas in 2003 and 2004, when they suffered their first mega drought forcing them to take emergency measures. They decreed that only a quarter of the backyard may have a grass lawn, front lawns were banned, and even incentives were made for people to rip out their existing front lawns. And all but one public golf course was shut down, their oldest one, which now runs on completely recycled water and was improved with all the latest water-saving gadgets. But plenty of private golf courses still remain. The big focus on grass is because each and every shower head in your lawn sprays out the equivalent of the average shower you take every day. So 10 sprayers in the yard equals 10 shower heads. And when you add all those lawns up, that's a lot of water. So if I were you, I'd invest in cactus stocks in the near future as desert scaping becomes the required norm. The final big change on a political scale will probably be the mindfulness of evaporation and how we store it. Right now, each state's water usage amounts do not even account for evaporation, 
which in a hot and dry climate is pretty silly, given how significant it really is. Things like balls on top of aqueducts to reduce evaporation, home water storage tanks and public areas to your yard may get installed in order to capitalize on those eight inches of rainwater Arizona gets every year. And in larger scale, somewhat exotic projects may grow in scale like the wetlands Arizona made decades ago, which provides a natural way of recycling previously used but reasonably treated water in ponds, which then naturally leak down into the groundwater. So assuming the states don't devolve into Wild West tactics and have themselves a shootout, for the most part, these adjustments should work and over time, more regulations and technology will be improved to keep these cities alive and thriving, albeit with likely slower growth rates and higher related building costs. But on the plus side, so long as people love living out West, that means rents and home prices will remain relatively steady since a cap on growth will be made making it to where the existing stock becomes more valuable. So prices will only have one direction to go. But of course, this is an issue that transcends making a quick buck. At its core, this water drought is perhaps the largest foreshadowing of our collective endgame if we don't change our trajectory and take responsibility for it now. But fire and brimstone consequences shouldn't be our focus. Because with just a little bit of collaboration, the Southwest has a bright future ahead with hundreds of years of water left. So let's not screw it up. 